still talking about carbon-based molecules, and so we've talked about fat, and now we're going to talk about these. And so we're going to start with carbs. You might be tempted to think that carbs are the enemy because I've talked about them like that. And it's true that when you do eat carbs, it increases insulin. And when you increase insulin, it will cause you to increase fat storage. And so by eliminating carbohydrates, a lot of people lose weight. But here's the thing. Sometimes you want fat storage. Like, for example, if you're trying to build muscle, it's actually beneficial to take a little bit of carbohydrates after a workout. And so carbs aren't all bad. You also need carbs for other things like fiber. And we'll talk all about it. But first off, what is a carb? So a carb is made with carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Let's rearrange those letters like this. Sounds like CHO. And so carbon, uh, for every one carbon, there will be two hydrogens and one oxygen. That is the ratio. And we could actually count that. So for example, glucose, if you counted all the carbons, which we can, one, two, three, four, five, six, there'd be six carbons. Uh, take my word for it, there's 12 hydrogens, and if we counted the oxygens, that would be six oxygens. And that is true for all carbohydrates, no matter how big or how small. So let's start with how small they can be. They can be monomers, and here are some examples of monomers. They can also be polymers. The smallest polymer would be a disaccharide, and we can see that here. This is common table sugar. It's very sweet because it's small. As a general rule, the smaller a carbohydrate is, the more sweet it is. And so sucrose sugar is very sweet because it's only a disaccharide. However, we could continue to, to polymerize this by adding another sugar uh, or carbohydrate to the mix. We could just keep adding these. And the more we add, the less sweet it gets. The longer a chain of this stuff is, the more we call it complex. And so let's start looking at those carbohydrates. Carbohydrates in includes uh, fiber, cellulose, starch, glycogen, bread, pasta, and many more things. But we'll talk about each. So first of all, uh, there's fiber. And we really need fiber in our diet. Fiber is unique in that it doesn't break down into glucose in the body. It does a little bit. I should, I should say it does break down a little bit, and it will raise your blood sugar a little bit, but not a lot at all. And so actually people who avoid carbohydrates, um, when they're looking at a food label, they will actually consider fiber to be good. They actually exclude fiber from the total carbohydrate count. So in other words, if you look at a food label and it says carbs, and then it has the carbs listed, it has like sugar, and then it has like fiber, and let's say the total carb count is 12, the sugar count is 2, and the fiber is 8, they actually subtract the 8 from the 12. And so that really means to them that there's only four carbs, not 12. So if you're trying to keep your carbs low, uh, fiber doesn't matter. You can have as much as you want. All right, so then um, cellulose is a natural form of fiber. That's where we get it from. And that is the outside layer of a plant cell, basically through what we'll learn about later, photosynthesis. A plant can take in sunlight and CO2 and spit out oxygen, but also glucose. That glucose is a carbohydrate that can be used for many things, such as building a cell wall. We can't actually digest that because it's too complex of a carb, and so it's fiber. Uh, the other thing that a plant can do is store it as starch. Now we can digest starch. Starch is digestible, and actually, um, we can see that right here. This lady uh, is on a show called Strange Addiction. She loves... Health issues, stomach pain, and constipation. 
she's really hurting herself with this cornstarch. Right now, I think Nikki's eating three to four boxes a week. You get the idea. So she's eating cornstarch. So what does that mean? What's happening to her? Why is it, why is it so unhealthy? The reason is plants, they make glucose and fructose through photosynthesis. And then they turn that into, so this could be glucose here, and then they turn that into starch, which is just a whole bunch of them connected. I should really do this beforehand. You get the idea. <laughs> wow, that was bad. So starch is much bigger than glucose. So this starch is not sweet to her. It's very plain tasting. And that's because it's too complex. So while plants turn um, glucose into starch, when we eat starch, we turn it back into glucose. And so that means we get a lot of what we call blood sugar, even though it's blood glucose levels. People just call it blood sugar because they don't understand the difference between sugar and glucose. Um, sugar is actually a bigger molecule than glucose, but I digress. Um, that's starch, right? So then we've got glycogen. So glycogen is how humans store our carbohydrates. We are not plants, uh, but we do store some carbs for energy use. And then bread and pasta would be a good example of isolated starches. We, we take uh, wheat, take the seeds from wheat, and we grind them up, and we turn that into bread. So what are some uses for the body? For fast explosive energy, you want carbs. Now I've told you before that fat can give you energy. So fat gives energy through what are called ketones. And carbs give energy through what's called glucose. So even though this is made of complex carbs, when Michael Phelps eats it, it will be converted to glucose in the body, and that will power his movements. Um, so let me describe the differences here. For the SOL test, you don't even need to remember that fat makes energy. You only need to remember this. And the reason why is um, it's sort of new science that we're looking at, the, the energy production of ketones. So for the SOL, just remember that carbohydrates give you energy. Uh, the truth is that fat does too. And actually fat, in my opinion, gives you better energy, um, but they are different, right? So have you ever heard somebody say when they're, let's say this lady is running and she gets tired, she starts off really fast, but then over time, her speed slows down, right? But then she catches a second wind. Have you heard this term, second wind? You see, what is happening is she starts off by burning glucose, but eventually all of that stored glucose, which is glycogen, gets used up. And then all she has left is ketones. So she will actually switch to fat burning and when she does that, she will experience her second win. And so the truth is there are two forms of energy. The advantage of carbs is it's fast and explosive. When Michael Phelps would swim his races, the night before he would eat like three pizzas. That was his secret. All right, so other things it does is it spikes insulin. So when you increase insulin, which is a hormone, you are actually going to increase fat storage. But that's not always a bad thing. Um, when you do that, it also increases uh, muscle synthesis. So it actually, if you're trying to get bigger and stronger, it's actually helpful to have a small portion of carbs after a workout. Um, okay, so other is fiber for digestion, and the best source of that is cruciferous vegetables. So even though Michael Phelps is famous for eating a lot of pizza, I can assure you that he has since switched from that to uh, more like these cruciferous vegetables. Great sources of uh, carbohydrates and fiber. Healthy carbs. 
All right, so next, um, cell membranes for receptors. So every cell in your body is like a house, and you have 100 trillion of them or more. Each of those houses needs an address, so all we do is we stick some sort of carbohydrate out there. Because of the vast number of shapes that a carbohydrate can take, after all it is just a string of carbons, you can have many different receptors, and so each cell type gets its own special address. That's very important for when we need to send a cell something very specific. Okay, so that's the basics of uh, carbohydrates. It is our primary energy molecule. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about how the body digests them in another chapter. But for now, let's move on to proteins. So we get proteins from meat, primarily, uh, by consuming other animals. Uh, but there's also proteins found in wheat, there's proteins found in plants, there's proteins found in everything that is alive. So the flow of information in life goes like this. You have cells, and those cells build tissues. Those tissues build organs, those organs build organ systems. You've probably heard this before, and I'm sorry for my bad, bad handwriting. Let me actually put this tablet down so I can write better. So again, um, you have cells, and your cells make tissues. Those tissues make organs. Those organs make organ systems. And then those organ systems make a living thing, an organism. So what comes before cells? What actually makes a cell? Well, you guessed it, protein, mostly. There's also uh, things like lipids and carbs involved, like for example, we talked about the cell membrane, but most of a cell is made of protein. Protein is extremely diverse in its shape. So for example, this is a protein, this is a protein, this is a protein, and proteins are specific for organisms. You, for example, have human protein, whereas a cow has cow protein. Now, when you actually eat the cow, um, you don't become the cow. So if, let's, let's describe that. If I eat a burger, um, if I eat the burger, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it into human protein rather than becoming a cow. <laughs> and so what does that mean? It means that we have to break it into its parts. So let's describe that. There's protein and then there's its pieces. So the monomers of protein are amino acids. When you put those amino acids together, and I'll use a circle to represent that, you start getting a polypeptide. You then fold it like a clown folding a balloon animal and you get a protein. And so you can see here that this protein has many different amino acids on it that are all folded in a very strange way and that creates a very unique function. For proteins, form is function. Um, to sort of help you understand that, the shape of a bicycle tire helps it to move. Well, this way. But if you change the shape of a bicycle tire to a square, it would have a hard time functioning. And so in biology, form equals function. It really seems obvious, but the reason I say that is to avoid people saying things like, they believe in intelligent design. So believing that a need is, something is needed and so that need creates the form. That's not the case. It is the form randomly being generated by nature that creates the function. I know that sounds overly philosophical, but it is important. Okay, so these are proteins. Let's take a closer look at how we build them. So what we do is we take these things called amino acids, which are monomers. This would be a, a monomer. 
of amino acids, and then we just start linking them. We link them together like um, a train pulling trolleys. The first amino acid is always methionine. We'll talk more about that later. I always abbreviate methionine as M-E-T. And so here's how they connect. We call it a peptide bond. And here we can see two amino acids. And what's going to happen is a dehydration. So you take the hydroxide and then you take a hydrogen here. And of course that will make water. But it, we are losing water, so that is dehydration. And that will create a bond. This bond is called a peptide bond. And when we start linking these amino acids together a lot, we start getting a polypeptide. And so if we go back a level, each of these bonds in the middle here are peptide bonds. So we have peptide bond after peptide bond after peptide bond, and that is why we call this a polypeptide. All right, so I have drawn a little bit of detail here, but you might notice this. What are these R's? If you look at a periodic table of elements, you will never find R. There is no element R. This represents something. And so if we look back at proteins, they have extremely interesting shapes. But if you look at their pieces here, they look the same, don't they? How could a bunch of things that look the same make something so unique? The answer is they're not really the same. This R group is what is different, and there are 20 versions of it. So let's look at that R. There are 20 versions of this R group, and I've included two examples here. So these specific amino acids are called aspartic acid and glutamic acid. They are both amino acids. And again, amino acids build protein. So if you ever uh, look at a protein supplement, and you want to take that, you just know that you can also take amino acid supplements. This is really a gimmick. These two things pretty much do the same thing in your body. They're pretty much the same. The reason why is amino acids build proteins. Amino acids build these. And proteins just break down into these, right? And so really, when you eat protein, your body just breaks that down into amino acids and then you create human protein from that. By taking amino acids, you just skip a step. You, you already have it broken down, and so you turn it straight into human protein. Does that mean that this is better? Um, not necessarily. I think that um, breaking stuff down in your body uh, is healthy for you if you're breaking the right stuff down. Anyway, uh, there are 20 different amino acids because of this these side chains here, which remember, we had them labeled as R before. There are 20 versions of them, and you need all of these in your diet. These are amino acids that you have to have. You have to have them in your food. These are non-essential, meaning your body can make them, and these are conditionally, meaning sometimes they can make them if they have the correct precursor molecules. So you have to eat something to help make them. Uh, and a great example, probably the best example of amino acid rich food is clams. You see, not all protein is created equal. Proteins, they can be anything. I mean, there's human protein, cow protein, clam protein, and in this case, um, cow protein. And so, what makes one protein better than the other for the human body? How many essential amino acids it has, right? And so actually clam protein is one of the best sources of protein because when you break that protein down in the human gut, you get all of the essential amino acids plus non-essentials all in one package. It is one of the best sources of protein that you can get. All right, so um, we said that. And let's talk about enzymes, a special kind of protein. So again, I just want to point out, we're now almost at 20 minutes. Uh, this is turning into a kind of a long lecture. If you need to take a break, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, this doesn't have to be all done in one day. But if you can stand it, stick with me. Okay, so special proteins. 
special proteins um, that we need to talk about. We're going to talk about enzymes. So some proteins have the ability to manipulate other things in the body. And so manipulate means they can change them. We call these proteins enzymes. A lot of proteins, like for example, the proteins that make your muscle, um, or sorry, uh, bones or, or skin pigment, they, they don't really manipulate anything. They're just there. They're structure. But some do manipulate stuff, and those are enzymes. And so let's look at um, an enzyme here. Enzymes typically have an active site. And that is a specially shaped part of the enzyme that is designed to interact with a certain substrate. Substrates are specifically going to, to bind to specific enzymes, like a lock and a key. Then this enzyme will typically change the substrate somehow or transport it. So an enzyme typically operates by changing something or transporting it. To understand what an enzyme is doing, we have to understand reactions. And so let's talk about chemical reactions. Chemical reactions need a reactant and a product, and the arrow represents the progress. And so, for example, if I'm making Kool-Aid, it would be the mix plus water plus sugar and that would give me Kool-Aid. Over here we have the reactants and over here we have the products. There's two types of reactions we need to be concerned about. Exothermic and endothermic. Exothermic means to lose heat while endothermic means to absorb. And that's easy to remember because absorb means to come into and we have endo. Endo means enter Exo means leave. And so, for example, if we were to touch a flask and, and we touched it and it was hot, that is because heat is leaving the flask, and we call that exothermic, when heat is leaving the system. However, however, if we were to touch a flask and it's cold, that's because the flask is drawing the heat from our fingers into it, and that is endothermic. So something that is endothermic will typically be cold. We also have to be familiar with these graphs and you should recognize them uh, just by sight. And so if we look at endothermic and exothermic, there's a very clear giveaway. We look at the X and Y axis. The Y axis is representing how much energy is present and the X axis is representing time or reaction pathway. So over time, if we gain energy in our products, from our reactants, we are endothermic. Notice I didn't even look in the middle here. You can actually just erase this bump. Just erase that with your mind when you're trying to decide what this is, right? We look over here and the reactants have more energy than the products. This means that heat and energy left the system. There is less energy, so that is exo. Over here there was more energy, and so that's endo. So then the question is, what are these bumps? These bumps are called activation energy, which is already there. Activation energy is the amount of energy that is needed to overcome a reaction or to start a reaction. So, for example, um, if you were to drop a bunch of logs into the fire, and, or sorry, into the fireplace, they wouldn't just catch on fire. You have to put some energy into starting that fire. That energy is activation energy. And thank God we have that. Otherwise, we would all just be spontaneously combusting all the time, which means to just catch on fire. So our universe requires a lot of activation energy for things to happen. Okay, so sometimes activation energy is too great for things to happen naturally in the body, and we need some help. To reduce activation energy, you need a catalyst. So again, activation energy is the energy needed to start a reaction. And then a catalyst will reduce that. And here we see an example. Here we had a very high activation energy. 
but a catalyst came in and you can see that this little hill went down. This little hill is smaller now so it's easier to get over. And so what is helping it to get over? If you look, we're, we're, I'm trying to show you something here. There is a substrate, this is light pink stuff, and then there's this purple enzyme. And again, substrates bind to enzymes. When they bind, they reduce activation energy. In this case, it is transporting. And that's going to make the reaction happen faster, this exothermic reaction. And so enzymes are proteins which can catalyze a reaction. All right, so that does it for protein, the, the very interesting and dynamic molecule. And now we'll talk about nucleic acids. So this is the information molecule. Nucleic acids help to create information that helps to make proteins. And so again, um, I told you that every organism has its own proteins. So we have human protein that we make from amino acids from our food, right? But how do we know how to design that human protein? Why, don't, why is it that we're not accidentally designing monkey protein or insect protein or squid protein? The answer is we have special instructions. And so those instructions come in the form of nucleic acids. Specifically, the type of nucleic acid I'm referring to is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. But first, let's talk about nucleic acids in general. The pieces of a nucleic acid is a nucleotide. Now, these words sound the same if you look at them. Nucleotide and nucleic acid. And so it might be hard for you to remember. But just remember, the polymer is bigger and nucleic acid is two words, whereas nucleotide is only one word. And so it should be easy for you to remember that the monomer is nucleotide while the polymer is nucleic acid. And so here's a basic nucleotide. We have parts to this. There's a phosphate group. There is the sugar, which is a carbohydrate. And then there's a nitrogen base, so it just contains nitrogen. This nitrogen base has different versions uh, because, again, this is information and it needs to have a code. And so this nitrogen base can be either an adenine, a thymine, a guanine, a cytosine, or a uracil. This last one depends on which nucleic acid we're working with. So. This is only a single monomer, which begs the question, how do we polymerize? It's very easy. We take this phosphate here and we connect it to what's called the three prime carbon. And so the way you count that is, first of all, there's an oxygen here. You count one, two, three. And so on the third carbon there, the phosphate will connect from an adjacent nucleotide Likewise, this will connect to another, and so on and so forth. When we do this, we create these nucleic acids. And so there's two versions. There's deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid, and they have different purposes. They are both forms of information. DNA is long-term information that we pass down from generation to generation, whereas RNA is used during your lifetime. In fact, RNA is a copy, a small copy of DNA. Another difference is RNA is single-stranded, while DNA is double-stranded. They are also made of different sugars. And we talked about that. If we go back here, this part is the sugar. They have different sugars. Well, this actually isn't a sugar, it's a carb, just I don't know why they keep calling it sugar all the time. Um, it's not really a sugar, that's, that's a disaccharide. This is a carbohydrate. So the carbohydrate here and here are different. And if you look, it's different on the 
two prime carbon. And so here we have a hydroxide and here we do not. And that is why there's a different name for the carb that is on the nucleotide. All right, uh, also another difference. So while they do share these bases, which is all this stuff in the middle here, um, thymine is unique for DNA, whereas uracil is unique for RNA. If this doesn't make any sense to you yet, don't worry, we're going to talk more about that later. All right, I think that's it. Um, I hope it wasn't too confusing. We're going to talk a lot more later about proteins and nucleic acids. So if all you understand for now is fats and carbs, I would say you're in decent shape. I'll talk to you later.